I'll just kick things off by saying my name is Tutuo. I am the educator here at the Litchfield Historical Society. And I am very pleased for our <clears throat> second of this winter uh, series for our Sunday afternoon lectures in which we partner with the League of Women Voters to um, bring important topics for informed citizens. And uh, of course, I'm joined by my co-host, Marianne, who is our League representative. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much, Kate. And good afternoon. My name is Mary Ann Sieber. I am a board member of the League of Women Voters of Litchfield County. And I welcome you to our program this afternoon entitled Public Education, the New Battlefield for Educating Democratic Citizens in Controversial Times. The League is a political nonpartisan organization welcoming a diverse membership, regardless of gender, gender identity, or political perspective or affiliation. We study issues rather than supporting political parties, agendas, or candidates. The League has been recognized for its work in fostering civic engagement and education through forums just like this. Our hope is that our efforts will help shape public policy, support needed legislation, and promote informed citizenship at all levels of government. This year, the League of Women Voters of Litchfield County decided to continue our focus and our efforts in the area of education. In fulfilling that goal, we are co-sponsoring a virtual lecture series with our partner, the Litchfield Historical Society. And today is the second of this series, and we will have our last um, program four weeks from today. Uh, so for more information about our League of Women Voters chapter, our upcoming events, or to become a member of the League, please visit our website, which is litchfieldlwv.org. And thank you for attending this forum today. Um, <clears throat> so um, I have, have the pleasure of introducing our speaker for today. Oh, actually, wait, Marion, was... Was I supposed to? I forget no, now. I'm going to do it. <laughs> You're going to do it. Never mind. Never mind. So, Marianne, back to you. Marianne, who is our speaker today? <laughs> I want to say to Betty and Jerry, if you, I'm just anxious that you're not hearing us. So if you could just give us a thumbs up or, or I should say just okay or something like that in the chat box. Otherwise I'll, um, when I'm finished the introduction, I'll try to help you via the chat box. So to help us address these issues, the league has invited Dr. Richard Hirsch to help us explore how best to educate future generations with the goal of producing informed, civil participants in our democracy. Our speaker offers a unique perspective by way of his 360 degree experience as a former high school social studies teacher, professor of education, teacher trainer, consultant to school systems, college and university administrator, and author of many books and articles regarding the nature of effective schooling, teaching and learning. Dr. Hirsch will touch base on the evolving goals of public education and education debates over the past century that helped to inform our current situation. He will define where curriculum control lies, some of the issues fueling parental fears, and why there is a demand to pull back the proverbial curtain to see what is happening in classrooms across America. Importantly, he will discuss why he believes education in America is failing to adequately prepare citizens to set up as civil participants in our democracy and what we can do about it now. Richard Hirsch is currently a member of the Guilford, Connecticut School of Board, School Board of Education and a lecturer in the Education Studies Program at Yale University. He received his bachelor's and master's degrees in political science and history from Syracuse University and an EDD from Boston University. He taught high school social studies in suburban Boston and in the Boston public schools and began his higher education career as an education professor at the University of Toledo. He, his mo his moved on, he has moved on to become the director of the Center for Moral Development at Harvard University, followed by a decade of work in teacher education and the Dean of the Graduate School 
and Vice President for Research at the University of Oregon. He then served as Provost at the University of New Hampshire and Drake University, becoming President of Hobart and William Smith Colleges and then Trinity College in Hartford. He also served as a Congressional Fellow and is the author of many scholarly articles and books on what makes some schools more effective than others, the nature of moral education in public schools, and the changing nature of American colleges and universities. His most recent book, We're Losing Our Minds, Rethinking American Higher Education, which has also been co-authored with Richard Keeling, and that's a 2012 publication, was the subject of his interview for the Colbert Report. In addition to his scholarly writing, Richard has also authored articles for Newsweek and the Atlantic magazines. Thank you, Richard. Well, thank you, and thank you to the Historical uh, Society and the League of Women Voters for the invitation. Let me um, first note that I am not speaking for the, in any way representing the views of the Board of Education in Guilford, much less anything at Yale University, so that um, that gets out of the way quickly. Um, <clears throat> let me speak for about 25 or 30 minutes and then we'll have questions. Um, so schools are, let's, let's remind ourselves in terms of issues of control. Schools are the designated state and local entities serving to educate for literacy and democratic citizenship. They've been the fundamental purposes of schooling from colonial times. And we've always seen schooling as a public good, but we've also seen public education as a moral enterprise in two ways. First, that we ought to educate students for democratic citizenship. And second, we actually authorize schools as our moral agents, along with parents, to spend years to make good Americans out of children, as Elizabeth Brunig says in a recent Atlantic Monthly article. In a sense, Schooling is our societal means for perpetuating our culture, especially what we mean by American democracy. And how best to do this has always been a matter of contention and is especially high right now. We need to remember that unlike other countries, we don't have a national ministry of education and we invest in state and local communities as the primary arena for educational debate and control. And while we actually have the semblance of a national curriculum, um, we don't have a national way of controlling schools, albeit in the last 20 years, the federal government has gotten more involved in issues of funding. So um, in our history, Schools have been incredibly important with regard to democratic citizenship. And de Tocqueville, for example, in his famous book, Democracy in America, said that, quote, it cannot be doubted that in the United States, the instruction of people powerfully contributes to the support of a democratic republic. And such must always be the case. I believe, he said, where instruction which awakens the understanding is not separated for moral education, which amends the heart. So he clearly understood that this is more than an intellectual exercise. It's got everything to do with um, our emotions uh, and our character. So public education and democracy are really at the core and they're at the core as a deeply moral enterprise. Public education therefore is bound inextricably with the notion of democracy in this country. The stakes are high, they always have been, and at the moment passions are flowing. So how best to fulfill these objectives that have been de debated uh, since our founding? Um, well, the current moment suggests that we are facing what many are calling an existential crisis of democracy. And we are deeply divided about many issues vaccinations, masking mandates, the role of free press, notion of freedom of speech or not, cancel culture, 
election integrity, voter access, racism, sexism, homophobia, abortion, critical race theory. And then these issues of prohibition of books and other materials for discussions in schools that might quote, cause students discomfort. In a sense then, with all these national conversations, controversial ones at that taking place, schools are at the crosshairs of all these questions, which I can tell you firsthand has made school board meetings very public and fraught. Well, what do we mean when we say we wanna prepare the next generation? We're really saying that we wanna prepare people to, to learn what we talk about as cultural literacy, our history, language, enough math and science and civic literacy that actually makes us more than individuals, but joins us together in some sort of a collection, a nation. Early on, schools serve not only as basic literacy, uh, education enterprises, but also moral and character education. Many of you in the audience may remember we used to get report cards, at least in my day, with comportment um, check marks on it. We were actually sent home with report cards in which teachers would talk about whether we were good or bad, whether we behaved appropriately, uh, whether we listened well. And those were in fact taken seriously by parents, um, perhaps more so than we as students. Um, Schools have taken on more than that now. They've taken on preparation for work, college, and personal and social development in ways that we never thought schools would be involved. Um, but these purposes have always been in flux. We've been constantly debating um, what schools ought to be doing. Um, the definition of basic literacy has been changing, particularly since the end of World War II in response to national and global change. There's been increased economic and national defense competition. There's been much more immigration and therefore the need to integrate immigrants. There's an increasing technology factor uh, and therefore that changes the nature of education. There's been a heightened concern for social justice and equity concerns. There's been a, a, a powerful, powerful demand for schools to prepare students for colleges in ways that we didn't see much before World War II. And because the cost of schools has continually risen and because the nature of the way in which we fund schools, mostly by local taxes, have not changed, there's been an increased demand for accountability. And that accountability has actually increased the public's disenchantment with American schooling. Uh, in fact, as we've done more and more assessment of what's been learned in schools over the last 40 years, we note that achievement is now surpassed by almost all other modern countries that we um, compare ourselves to. Um, so th let's look at this. Um, Early on, education was mostly for white boys and eventually moved on increasingly to girls. Um, and then eventually we increased the grade levels from basic one through five or six to high school. Um, and schools became heavily um, paid attention to in the 50s and 60s on moral grounds alone. We had, we had um, the moral majority in the 50s and 60s. We had civil rights era joining. We had John Birch Society. We had um, uh, people questioning why schools were getting involved in anything besides basic literacy. We also had a change in who attends schools. Um, more and more people were taken in uh, as 12 year uh, attendees and we changed the laws to require school attendance through age 16. So not only do we go from boys 
to women and immigrants. But now we've seen a large influx of first generation children, lots of language changes, um, and the complexity of what teaching uh, and schooling is about is far different than it was in earlier times. So just since the mid 19, mid the mid 20th century, just think about some of the things, the watershed moments in the last 60, 70 years. Brown versus Board of Education, 1954, which really started the whole issue of how to look at issues of segregation and the issue of race as it specifically deals with schooling, what we teach, how we teach, how we integrate people into the, into the school system without perpetuating injustice. 1957, we had Sputnik and the feeling that we were now falling behind uh, our competitors in then Soviet Union, math and science became emphasized. Some argued to the detriment of things like reading and writing. Um, and we ended up having significant work in curricula so that we ended up in the 60s with the new math, the new science, the new social studies, the new literature, new meaning, reconfigurations in trying to, in fact, become much more internationally competitive. 1975, we had Public Law 94142, which is the Education of Handicapped Act, which was itself a concern for equity. Uh, and it revolutionized the way in which we started understanding the issue of how to treat students with then what we call special needs now. Uh, the cost became astronomically greater, still borne mostly by locals. Uh, local school systems, and that stays with us. Uh, in 1983, we had probably one of the most significant national task forces issuing a report called Nation at Risk, in which that report said that if we had purposely tried to weaken our national defense, we could not have done it any better than by uh, operating our schools at the mediocre level that we were then in 1983. It created quite a fuss. Um, Reagan was president at the time, and there was a push then to ask questions about what was wrong with schools, why Johnny couldn't read, and people became very, very interested all over again with the nature of schools and its quality. Uh, that continued through uh, both Bush presidencies uh, with the uh, latter Bush uh, dealing with this national attempt to improve education with the law No Child Left Behind in 2001, making the argument that the differentiation between people in classes or races in achievement in schools was widening and deepening and that there shouldn't be no child left behind, at least in basic skills. And so that became a mandate, a federal mandate with some funding, never enough, of course but another national conversation about the role of schools in our society. Obama continued that with another program built on No Child Left Behind called Race to the Top. That was about 2012, which was actually an extension of, and again, still a focus on what we think of as basic skills, but also an attempt to upgrade national and state education standards an attempt at that point with foundations entering the, play, the, the marketplace of creating a, a common core of education for students. That politically didn't go well and essentially had been rejected uh, to a large degree. Uh, we also began to talk about the need for greater amounts of pre-kindergarten so that early childhood education has become very, very important, both because the science of learning and neuroscience of learning have informed us about early childhood and that there's nothing more important uh, in uh, the way in which we educate our children than starting when they're most malleable, which is from birth to three or four. So that takes us up to the current time. So we've now had 40 years of dissatisfaction with school outcomes. Um, and we have learned the following, which is exacerbated the concern for accountability. Um, we are one of 46 countries that ask our students to take an international assessment across 
all the disciplines and civic education through the, the rigorous test called Program for International Student Assessment. PISA is its short form name. And we have for almost 20 years now come out barely in the top, just barely at 18 to 22 in, a, in the 46 countries. Almost all um, modern democracies and non-democracies are above us in achievement across the board. On our own best national assessment, um, national assessment for educational progress in which samples of students at various grade levels across the country every several years take this test. And it is considered to be a very fair and reasonable test. We've only seen marginal progress on any of the things that have been measured over the past 30 years. And that has reflected as well in static or lower SAT scores and ACT scores since the 60s. So in a sense, whatever public accessible national international data that we've gathered about how well we are doing suggests that we're not doing very well. But that gets us to then not just so much about whether students are learning how to read and write or do science or math, but how well are we doing with regard to issues of democratic citizenship? But well, there's some worrying information about that as well. For example, in the National Education for National Association for Educational Progress, National Assessment in 1998 found the following. Three quarters of the students exhibited minimum basic or below basic civic knowledge, three quarters. In 2010, two thirds reached that same level. And less than one third of eighth graders could identify the purpose of the Declaration of Independence, even though the thrust of the answer is in the title. Four fifths of 12th graders in 2010 failed to explain how citizenship participation benefits society in America. In a 2000 survey of social studies teachers, 15%, only 15%, thought their students understood concepts such as federalism and separation of powers. On the 2000 US government uh, AP tests, um, advanced placement tests on US government, the mean score, the mean score was 2.6 on a five point scale. That score was the lowest mean score of 46 different kinds of AP tests. And we know that three is a minimum score for possible college credit. So students who take AP are generally among our most um, advanced students. And even at that, um, the mean score was below three. And in 2016, in, in a survey of American public about civic knowledge, only one third of the public could identify three branches of government. So given all this data and given the political controversies that we are facing, there is a renewed current interest in education for democratic citizenship. And so we, we, we take on this national conversation again, including today, um, noting that it is inherently difficult and we're being confronted by these issues in the context of COVID, uh, that the fear and anxiety that that has brought on and a, a, a real level of distrust about government and anger, uh, particularly over the last four to six years. School board decisions then have all of a sudden become the center of political discussion, uh, often with far more heat than light. I can tell you from firsthand knowledge, but certainly you can read it daily in the newspapers, there's increasingly contentious public comments made during school board meetings, not to mention the fact that attendance at school board meetings have quadrupled, if not increased by tenfold as a matter of course, either in person or online as they happen to be held. Teachers and boards 
as well as administrators are increasingly subjected to noxious, noxious accusations and demands. Uh, and the social media comments we get and emails we get are in fact often threatening. Uh, this is happening to public educators. In 37 states, there are now laws or proposed laws demanding that students not be taught anything that might put this country or whites, white people in particular, in a negative light. So given all the data on achievement with regard to basic literacy as well as citizenship, not to mention these data I've just given you, what's going on? Well, to say the least, I would say we're having a profound cultural moment. We know that culture is a very powerful force. And we know from social psychology that if you change the culture, you change behavior. Uh, think of changing a coach, for example, on a team, and you can take a losing team, not change its membership, and you can change the culture of that team, its expectations, its standards, its practices, its feedback, and you can change that team because you change the culture and it will change into and does often change into a winning team. We know the same thing in changing heads of corporations. Um, we know it too when we change presidents of countries. Um, but we also know in reverse that individual behavioral change, ultimately, if it gets to be enough across people, changes the culture itself. A good example of those things would be what we wear or uh, music changing or the way in which we communicate. And so we have adopted over the last 20 or so years, a large part of what the adolescent culture has in fact brought to us uh, through language, music, dress, and their use of iPhones and so on. Um, in any case, whether it's larger cultural change, changing behavior or reverse, it always touches schooling. So when the drug culture begins to be uh, widespread, um, we, see, we see it in schools and schools have to take that on. And um, this is not part of what we meant to be the curriculum. When mental health becomes increased concern because depression and anxiety um, and, and, and families are having problems, that manifests itself in attendance and discipline and in acting out in schools, that becomes a school problem. Um, as that becomes a school problem, it becomes a community problem. And so we then have to constantly make sure that we're getting adequate support for the schools that now have to deal with more than they were doing with yesterday. Moreover, I would say that over the last several decades, we have seen a coarsening of our culture. Less respect for government, police, banks, drug companies, news media. Um, social media is now ubiquitous and it is not necessarily enlightened. There's been a decrease in civility, a lessening of student attention span in schools. And in, given all this, we could probably say as an understatement, we are no longer a leave it to beaver or a father knows best, or dare I say it, a Bill Cosby show culture. We used to actually celebrate those shows and those like them in common. Worryingly, in my view, at least, there's a fracturing of our social contract. And it seems that there's a lack of understanding uh, and a commitment to the notion of e pluribus unum, out of many one. And while it remains on our currency, in our dollar bills, it's something that we no longer take for face value and don't understand. We're deeply divided about what constitutes the public good and what the appropriate role of schools should be in building this cultural context in which we see beyond our individual selves. And we understand that in fact, there's something more than uh, a zero sum game. So I think we momentarily at least have lost our way in this path uh, to create a commonly understood balance between individual freedom and the collective good. And this of course is a crucial ingredient for our understanding about how to, how to create new citizens and 
what we mean by Democrat citizenship. Um, both as a researcher, as a teacher, as a school board member, uh, what I see is a, um, an increasing lack of basic knowledge, particularly about American history. Um, and in that, in that ignorance, uh, an arrogance on, on people's part uh, and a contempt for expertise. Um, so that in some sense, there is an arrogance of ignorance, um, partly because of a flood of misinformation, but misinformation only works when people don't know enough about to counter it, but simply take it in as truth. So we each, in a sense, are creating our own fake news streams when we should have been actually educated to do better than that. Um, we maintain that we want to teach for critical thinking and to be skeptical and to raise questions and to be independent learners and to be autonomous and not to be indoctrinated. Yet we're seeing the effect of all that kind of thing happening, um, both from the political sphere, the media sphere um, and social um, communication sphere. Uh, we don't have to look at the local or even state level. We can simply look at behavior of our Congress, where we can see many congressmen and senators uh, saying and doing things in total contradiction to what we know to be historically true and what the Constitution claims is law. Uh, the difference we have now is that it's all on videotape. So for people to deny their own behavior is getting hard. Uh, whether or not we're willing to deal with it and confront it is still an issue that we're, I think, tackling. So this is not a pretty picture that, we're, that I'm picturing here. Um, and I think that the way we begin to actually get out of it is we have to re-engage and revalue the notion of excellent education um, as we want to move out of this current dilemma. Um, research on effective schools shows that you get absolutely powerful and inspiring success at whatever level we're talking about, the highest level of schooling, um, when you change the culture in and out of schools. Uh, it's not about increasing technology. It's not about giving every student a computer. It's not about more television. Um, it is something very human. And we learned it during the COVID um, um, video streaming days of last year. There's just nothing as powerful as teacher and students, class, human interaction as a central part of teaching. And not only do we have to get back to that, the best of that, but we have to improve what we've been doing for the last 50 years. So what does that mean? Well, first we have to agree that life is not a true false question. Um, life is far more complicated and nuanced than teaching students how to answer true false or do matching questions. Um, and um, a per, F, F. Scott Fitzgerald once said that the test of a first rate intelligence is the ability to hold two opposed ideas in the mind at the same time and still be able to function. One should, for example, be able to see things as hopeless, yet be determined to make them otherwise. So the first thing we need to note there is that first rate intelligence is learned. We're not born with that. It is learned and we learn that the combination of home, in school, from media, from friends, from peers, the environment is constantly our teacher and schools are a formalized way in which we ask that we do this on purpose. Um, the problem we have in schools is that we've engaged in substantial amount of passive learning only. 90% of what students are asked to learn in schools, all the way up through, by the way, including college, is mostly at the knowledge level, memory level, or understanding level, both low levels, that is, you can put things into your own words. That's different than the ability to be able to take knowledge and to use it in new situations, or to be able to analyze, take apart something into its constituent parts, and, and see its weaknesses and strengths, or, or to synthesize things and take pieces that are separate and construct something new out of it, much less to make judgments about good and bad in a way that one can evaluate one's own learning. So passive learning is important in the sense of taking in some basic knowledge, 
but it's the modality that is actually hurting us when in fact, if we're gonna ask for good citizenship, we're asking people to engage in the use of knowledge and the way one learns that to engage it is different than the way we've been teaching. Um, we're asking students all the way through college, far too little writing, far too little reading. Writing is thinking made public. It's much tougher to be accountable for your thoughts if it's down in writing than it is if you say it um, and then it's lost. So that to the degree that we don't ask for much, in American higher education, we have found that juniors have had less than 30 pages of writing required through high school and the first two years of college. I think that speaks for itself. Therefore, we're paying much more lip service than anything else to teaching for critical and independent thinking. Um, and we're increasingly, particularly in K through 12, we're increasingly worried about teaching controversial questions or, or dealing with ambiguity, which most complex questions are about. We don't have simple questions to, to some of the questions to the issues that we talked about earlier. This then is antithetical to the purpose of preparing citizens. Citizens are meant to be independent thinking, critical thinking, be able to gather information, make judgments, articulate in ways that are fair and reasonable, um, and means they have to have basic knowledge uh, as well as know how to use it and find it. There is this naive belief that because everything we ever need to know is on our phones, we don't need to know anything. And that's just not accurate. Um, um, so what do we do? Uh, we have to actually become much more effective in teaching accurate and accurate American history, for example. But to do justice to literature and art and music in the sense that they're no longer just white male achievements. They, the diversity of cultures that we're now America, the diversity of the world, of people, ideas, media, points of view, this is the world. And asking schools to deal with that effectively now is just far more pressure on us than ever before. Um, we have to acknowledge that the amount of time and the way in which students are using social media um, is in fact now becoming um, a liability. Uh, and that that conversation is increasingly being had with psychologists, social, social psychologists and educators. In what way can we turn that to a more positive way or does it have to be turned down or turned off you know, in, in some ways? We have to understand that it's not just American history any longer that's crucial. We are so interdependent in the world for, for our economy, for our cultures and so on that um, we can't rely on people to know just American history and be good democratic citizens. We're facing that now with Ukraine and all kinds of issues in the world, including the, the, the spread of the virus and the policies that are required for the world to beat this, not just one country, because we're no longer capable of doing that any longer by ourselves. Um, and finally, we need to remember that education for citizenship is not a school only responsibility that a lot of things happen both out of school and in the family, in the media, by peers, that powerfully influences not only what goes on in school, but how students become who they're becoming, often negating what we're trying to teach in schools. And so there needs to be a reestablishment re of a social contract between families and schools, and we cannot take that for granted. So finally, inclusion, I think there's an agreement that we are inadequately preparing students to be citizens in a democratic society. Uh, we've got to change that. We've got to change the culture of schools, the local communities, increase support from the community for this. Uh, we need far greater respect for teachers and administrators. They are experts in their fields. Um, and while this does not negate the right of the public to ask questions, um, the presumption should be that they're dealing with people who do know what they're talking about, but are open to the kinds of questions communities ask. Um, that is the disrespect that we said I'm seeing and we're documenting across the country 
for school people is not healthy. Um, finally, we do have to admit now, and we can do audits of our curriculum, that we, our curriculum has to become richer, more diverse. It has to become higher level, higher order level learning. And it has to be done not only in, in history and world history, but across the board. There is more than American music. Okay, there is um, more than American literature. There's more than male literature in history and so on. And uh, so we've learned a great deal in the last 50, 60 years. And we're back to asking basic questions and democratic citizenship has now become a new uh, primary objective. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dick. It's great. Yes, thank you. That actually, um, most of the, the talk I was sitting here thinking like, you know, how can, how can we as a museum, and I'm sure probably everyone here from the League of Women Voters, you know, how can we as institutions in our community, you know, support school systems in some of these, um, you know, in some of these ways? Because I think, you know, we already have some, some questions that have come in um, that I think we could probably jump right to. And I just want to start with this one from Margaret, because I think it sums up a big question that I was asking. You know, you, you talk so much about some of these, so many of these problems we see or, you know, issues we see in society now becoming, um, you know, looking to the schools to find the solution. Um, so Margaret asks, at what point can public schools say to society, stop looking at us to solve all of your problems? Um, and she also has another thing in here about, um, you know, uh, what, what solutions are there to, if schools are not going to be the solution to all the society's problems? Well, I think there, I think the silver lining in all the public attention, perhaps for the wrong reasons, but there's a lot more, there's really a lot more public attention at the moment on schools. Um, and so I think critical attention, but that gives us the opportunity to have the conversation that your question asks. It seems to me that both educators and, and, and those of us who are not in the employ of the local school systems, but whose, whose research and scholarship and looking at this, we know now two things. One, we know there's a need to make, to improve the effectiveness of schools per se at the curricular and teaching level. There are just things we need to be doing we're not doing now. And we have to admit that and say, we're gonna, we're gonna have to do that as a group of teachers. We're gonna just admit that as part of our agenda. We're gonna let you know we're transparent for these reasons so that there's nothing, uh, nobody's thinking we're gonna indoctrinate people or something else. That should always be an open question and it should be public. Um, and there's lots of things we have to do in terms of doing justice to issues of race and sexism and issues of drugs and mental health. Um, we can't keep just adding mental health workers and social workers to schools and think that's gonna solve the problem per se. Because school students are coming to us, okay, from what they're suffering outside of school. Many kids are coming to us hungry mm -hmm. in this day and age. Okay. Yeah, we saw that when the pandemic started, how- Kids are coming you know, to us from-, from school kids from, weren't getting meals. Mm -hmm. From not particularly stable households. Not only because they're one parent households, which is increasingly the norm, but because you got two parents working, the time is not devoted. Students are much more pure, they're, they're being raised by each other, but they're being raised by, in some cases, pretty vicious social media. And they can't process all that. Uh, so they come into school in classes of 20 to 25 or 30, and they're engaged in passive learning. They, they're not comfortable asking questions. They don't know how to, they don't know how to have the kind of conversation because they don't have relationships in a way that they could be um, authentic. So it just builds up. Conversely, boards of education and, and in some sense, teachers and administrators need to actually say to the community, we need to have a conversation much more frequently and publicly about what, do, what should we, the schools, expect you the community to be doing with students that we don't think is happening now. And, and, you know, what could we be doing both formally and informally, collectively for students after school, in the summers, 
what, how do we create a much more enriching informal curriculum that we, how do we get students to just read? Uh, can we get students to quadruple, right. their, quadruple their reading, okay, um, in ways that we could begin to count on as making them far more literate because we can't do it all because we've lost that. How do we get students to start respect, respecting each other as well as adults in the way in which they listen, ask questions, and um, uh, make sense of things? So we have that we have a, a lot of behavior repertoire we got to do both in schooling and with the community, and have that conversation. Say we got a problem. Okay, it's not just the schools. Okay. Right. So you're looking for a strong community across you know so that's where your that's where your library's funding comes into play and that's where yeah, yeah you know you got you got art associations that mm -hmm. have art education for kids from very early age to regular and they get they do you know as you can know art is a very powerful teacher and in the hands of people who really know it's just students should be exposed to that more than we're doing in schools because we're not doing enough music I mean, music is mm -hmm. incredibly powerful. We already do it a lot in athletics. We don't seem to have a disagreement about that. But what about all these other things? That's that we got to somehow get students into these things that really it, it always makes them feel good. But we are not structuring their lives in ways that we're enriching that. Um, some students don't have access to some of the art or music or travel that a lot mm -hmm. of other students don't, and we know that's very very enriching. How do we how do we do that? How do we increase that? Technologically, we know how to do that pretty well. I'm just, I'll, I'm hearing a case for um, museums being an integral role in society. Is what I'm hearing. Um, Marion, do you want to go with the next question? Certainly, because we have uh, quite a few coming up. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, I think I'll, I'll go from the bottom where we are. Um, what are your thoughts about the usefulness and effectiveness of standardized testing? Um, great, uh, it's a great question. And as I was talking about in my, in my earlier remarks from the eighties, especially since the eighties with no child left behind up to recently, we have been standardized test crazy. And we have been judging the, 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 the quality of our schools at the state level and at the local level by, by really reductionist standardized tests. And we have therefore ignored art and music and phys ed and lots of things uh, because we're not testing for them. So first of all, we have to understand if it's not tested, it's not valued, okay? That's not good. So we have to either change the nature of the way in which we test so that we are actually testing things we care about at higher levels of learning. But I would say standardized testing is only useful Okay, to give us a snapshot of how we might be doing over time um, as a collective. So there's nothing wrong with doing standardized tests every few years, not so much to make judgments about individual um, students or even individual schools because we're not fine grained enough to do that, but enough to see, well, why are we 21st against 46 countries? Like, what, yeah, what's going on here? Um, and uh, so I would, I would actually significantly decrease our concern with and uh, focusing on that and do much more qualitative testing, oral and written, in order to give what we call formative feedback, not at the end of a unit, but constantly giving feedback to students so they can still do something with it. Psychology tells us this, the single most powerful uh, form of teaching is to give frequent and accurate and adequate feedback. That's why we each hire private tutors for skiing and for tennis and for music, because we want immediate feedback. We want to do it in a way we're not embarrassed and we learn immediately from it. If I have to wait three, three days or four days to get a paper back, to find out I made some mistakes, it's too late. Um, and so how do we do that in a way that we're giving real authentic feedback in a timely way and not relying on standardized testing. So I would say that our standardized testing stuff uh, is really on haywire. And, and Dick, if you wouldn't uh, mind talking about school, school board members and do you think um, training is needed to be effective and for having them to be productive 
Board of Ed members, what would you recommend? Well, there is, well, first of all, um, state, there's a state association of school board that does formal training and there's lots of stuff that one gets um, when one becomes a new board member. Um, most school boards uh, bring on new board members and inculcate as it were through a formalized um, program that we uh, engage people with. Um, so yes, there should be some training, but the training that one needs mostly having started as a school board member three years ago and having just brought four new members on after our recent election um, is that a lot of that training takes place as a function of a good administration. Um, we have a great, we have a great superintendent in Guilford and um, our job as a, a board is primarily to make sure that he, the teachers and other ministers are getting the job done and we deal with policy, but we also, acknowledged that educational leadership is taking place in that milieu. We are not the educational leaders. We're the overseers. We have fiduciary responsibility, but most of us can't pretend we know as much about anything educational as the people who are doing it. So school board members need, first of all, to understand that they know relatively little. I'm professionally trained, spent 50 years, so I know a little bit more, but generally speaking, most board members are not professional educators. I would say, the first thing one should learn is humility. We have new board members coming on, uh, even when I come on. We actually thought we knew what you're talking about. We actually had a point of view about what was going on wrong in the schools. And then you find out the background information. Then you find out what the law is. Then you find out what the lawyers are saying. Then you find out what parents are sending you. And you begin to realize it's, it is really complex. So at that point, I think what a good board does is a good board needs to become um, a learning community in which not only are there wiser people on the board who know some of this can teach each other, but they needs to be in constant conversation with the school authorities and the teachers in order to learn what's actually going on, as well as have lots of interaction with the public. We learn so much from parents who are complaining in some sense, but they're telling us things that we don't live and we don't hear about until it's too late. And it's not that we say, okay, Mrs. Jones, I'll take that and I'll go and talk to that teacher about it. We never do that. We make sure the right person hears about it. Um, but the fact is you have to have antennae up and um, we're local schools and that's where local control is. And one of the upsides of it is that we hear about it. And one of the downsides is, is we hear about it. Um, and I would say that a, a board education is a, an exercise in, humility as well as sometimes futility, but that the, the, the we're sort of sandwich meat between the community and the teacher, the, the school, the schools themselves, and we have to sort of do justice to both those. Very good. Thank you. We have another question. Uh, this is coming from a league uh, member. Uh, local charter schools are being put forth as an alternative to public schools. And how is the increase in charter schools going to impact public funding, public school funding? Okay. I love these questions. Um, charter schools, as you may remember, were put forward because people were increasingly upset at, this, at their neighborhood schools and didn't feel they were getting what they wanted in the schools. It could have been oftentimes because they thought that it was inadequate basic education or inadequate moral education or inadequate um, uh, integration. And so charter schools were begun as ways of experimenting and giving more freedom to teachers and administrators out from under the purview of state law uh, and local strictures. The belief was that schools were just too much under the thumb of local people. And so, yeah, hired their own administration. They were always, when we made charter schools, they're always having to meet state requirements. Um, and what we found is this. The belief was that we had charter schools, they would invent things, they would create new curriculum, new teaching, they would improve learning. And in doing so, they, were, they would be lighthouses. They would be sparks of innovation and they would improve public schools. And, and, and we would take that and improve schooling. And many charter schools are also part of public schools. Here's what we know. 
I know the research on effective schools. Charter schools on average are no better on any measure, on any measure for the last 10 years, they are no better on any measure than regular public schools. Okay, that's number one. Number two, they take funding away from public schools because they, 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 they get less money, but, they don't, but the public schools who have lost students don't get the money those students brought with them when they went to school. Okay, so that in fact, charter schools, if, if charter schools were in fact universally better than public schools, we'd have to sit back and say, well, my goodness, they've proven the point. But it's not just charter schools. Uh, aside from the 10 best known private schools, the Exeters and the Andovers and schools like that, um, private schools generally are no better or no more effective on any measure than public schools. So you could pay $40,000 a year to a, a a modal private school and your, your child will do no better. So we have neither private schools nor charter schools that are lighthouses as it were. And so at the moment, charter schools effectively are doing harm to public schools to the degree they are not actually giving us any models for excellence. I, I don't mind us having charter schools in the name of innovation, but I don't think people should go around making a case that we should replace public schools with charter schools. There's absolutely no evidence for it whatsoever. Okay. And that's true across the world, by the way. Okay. You don't see charter schools happening in, in school systems that are beating the pants off us on every measure. There's a curiosity question about uh, what study are you um, referring to? Which, which, what when, when you're talking about the studies that charter schools are no better, oh, no, no more effective. I don't have one in mind. There's, there's at least 10 to 20 studies in the last five to eight years. A lot of them coming out of um, um, Columbia and Harvard and Stanford that have done what they call meta studies. They look at a hundred studies at the same time and not rely on one to ask the question, Every study that's been done on charter schools compared to public schools may find a big difference, a little different, but on it, but against a hundred studies, what do we find? So there's go to any, go to your any internet and say uh, charter school effectiveness versus public schools, and you will come up with many, many meta studies that will objectively be able to tell you uh, what I've been saying. Thank you for that. There's also a, a feedback about, um, I think this is going back to the question about training for Board of Education members. Patty reports that as a former school board member for six years, the CAB, C-A-B-E training. CABE, CABE, yeah. CABE is very important and humbling, she says. No single board member should be standing out, but the school board works as a unit for policy and support only. Yeah. I uh, in the three and a half years I've been on the board, we've never had a split vote on anything, but we work awfully hard. I mean, in many ways, we act like a jury. How do you know? There are a lot of new board members come on or run for school board with an agenda. They actually have agendas because, at least in this state, it's a partisan. There are partisan elections, and you, a school board that is partisan, that is that you're first a Democrat or Republican or whatever party, is going to fail. It's just going to fail. It's going to divide the community. So one of the things that school boards ought to be is not only overseeing the schools are about, they should also be um, instruments for community conversation. And in my view, bringing the community together and creating some sense of what we mean by a community good. That would be a, a very, very positive. In, in a sense, a school board is, a, is, a, is, a, is an educational teacher. We need to be able to translate the best of education to the community, uh, take leadership on educational issues, but not presume that we have it all. So that interaction I talked about earlier is really crucial. So here's a question from, from Jim, and I think he's sort of referring to um, the success of like highly um, like very strict, highly involved parents, um, sort of on the individual level. And if that is something that can be applied at a more, um, at like more of a group setting, 
uh, for for classroom or for academic success for for students. Yeah. Here's what 50 years of research says on what makes some schools more effective than others. Effective meaning um, measured learning, mm -hmm. any kind of learning that we think we purposely are trying to teach. The higher the expectations, the greater the learning. The higher the standards, the greater the learning. The greater amount of academic engaged time on what is to be learned, the greater the learning. Okay. The, the, the greater amount of feedback to students, the greater amount of learning. The better the teachers, the, the greater the learning. Um, <laughs> I'm, telling you, I'm telling you nothing that isn't common sense. We got 50 years of research that overwhelmingly says, but what the research says is it's not just one of those things. It's all of them together. You get a constellation of variables. There are a few others that when together forms a culture of a school and a culture of a community that gives you a multiplier effect, gives you a cumulative effect. So just to increase homework, which increases academic engaged time, wouldn't be enough if it wasn't appropriate homework. Just to give you more tests uh, or, or harder tests wouldn't be enough if they were poor tests. Just to get, have you write 10 more papers if they're the wrong kind of papers and no fever. So it's not simple, but when it's done properly, we now know that what we do on purpose, we know how to do, and we put it together. Same thing is true at home. Parents simply having conversations with the kids What's going on at school? What are you learning? I mean, in a, in a, in a, in a, a genuine intellectual way. Can, can we have conversations with kids about what they're learning? And, it, and you know, how does it relate to either their lives, their aspirations, what's going on in the world? Are we asking kids to read the newspapers? Are, are we asking them to make sense of the news programs? Are we even asking them to look at news programs? Well, think of all the things, think of all the things that we should be asking students to do um, as part of learning to be citizens. Uh, are we asking them to read weekly magazines or, or newspapers daily just because that's what citizens should do? Uh, are we talking about that in school um, so that we are connecting what goes on outside of school, what goes on in school? So I would say that in many ways, to the degree that we can get families to become um, teachers in the informal sense on purpose only supplements the amount of time and the amount of value that we, a student realizes that we're all putting on the same thing. Um, are parents voting and talking about why they're voting? Are parents talking about local issues and when they get upset and, and are they bringing their kids into those conversations? I'm talking not about high school kids alone. God, the, our junior high school kids are some of the most articulate kids when they come to school board meetings. It's just humbling to hear them get up there and talk about things that are really, really sharp. Um, and the sooner we can get that, the better. And so I, 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 how we fuse parent and schooling kinds of teaching and learning, I think will, will multiply our effectiveness. <laughs> And, I'm, I'm, and, and we, you know, it can be all kinds of formalized and informalized programs that the community and the schools can put together so that students get enrichment programs in the summers, uh, just not programs for kids who have to make up work. Um, and how do you do that so it's free? Uh, how do you do it in a way in which kids can do some things they didn't feel they could do in school, but which we should be doing or could be doing in schools? And some school systems, including Guilford, are doing that. It just sounds like another argument for the important role of museums in this community. Brought to you by... Once again, um, what are the school's community partners, museums, libraries, um, organizations uh, like the League of Women Voters? Um, okay, so again, if anyone has any last questions, um, feel free to, to drop those in either the chat or the Q&A. Um, there was one question that I thought was a great one, um, you know, sort of to wrap things up with. And this is a question from Audrey. Uh, you know, since since we are we have an audience, we are all here on a Sunday afternoon, listening and learning. Um, this question makes sense. It's what would you tell 
you know, a well-informed person how to make a difference. How can we as a community support the education of our, of our youth? Well, in this day and age, I, I take this for granted, but I, I, I'm constantly reminded I shouldn't. In this day and age, we are confronted by um, issues in which there are so many strongly articulated different points of view. That is the, the, the notion of diversity, of point of view, of race, of ideas, of, of perspectives is increasingly our reality. There's more Spanish spoken, there are different kinds of movies being, the music is, is diverse. And that is, that is actually um, in many cases overloading because people have not necessarily on purpose been taught how to deal with conflicting diverse points of view that, that it's, it's natural and good to figure out how to in fact um, take diverse points of view in order to find one's own truth as it were. So I would argue that the degree to which parents can um, espouse the value of their children coming in contact with different people, with different ideas, with different texts, with different experiences, um, and saying, it's good that you're doing this. this is, you're, gonna, you're growing up into a world that is incredibly diverse. It is absolutely international. Uh, if you're thinking about the, the work situation you're getting into, if you think about your personal relationships and who you're gonna fall in love with, if you're thinking about um, going to college and what that's now gonna mean, but when you get into the workplace before or after that, the world is so changed. You, you don't wanna come off, you don't wanna be a racist. Okay. You don't want to be somebody who's ignorant of things that are, are, you're oblivious to. And so what we mean by being educated in this day and age is both a broader kind of education, but one that also asks you to be um, a little bit more resilient in, com in coming in contact with things that look different than you and are different from what you currently understand and believe. How do we help students both at home, in the community, in school, become increasingly resilient to what appears to be mysterious and not fear it, not run from it and not get angry. How do we get people to sort of almost um, embrace the possibility that something new is in fact putting a puzzle together and not, and not making me feel um, inferior, uh, not feeling bad. To say, I don't know, or I would like to know more, should be a question that people should be hugged for, okay? Not made fun of. And we have an increased problem of bullying in schools, not just in terms of um, gender and race and weight, uh, et, et cetera, et cetera. But we have kids being judged, you know, that's a stupid question, or you were ignorant, I mean, kids call each other names. How do we much earlier from grade school and how do we teach kids on purpose that it's human to, to, to know things, to need to know. And the only way we can do that is to ask questions and to try answers out that might be wrong. And our job as peers or teachers is to have a civil conversation and not make fun of people. So there's a whole, there's a whole morality and ethic to what it means to be a good person on the one hand, to be a good democratic citizen. We used to teach this on purpose. We used to say it much more. We don't now. Um, and it sounds old fashioned, but I think we've got to go back to being sort of a little bit more substantially uh, authentically human about what we mean by education. All right, so why don't we take these last, uh, just last two questions, and I think this one actually um, you partially answered in your um, in your last question. <clears throat> but if you had anything else to add um, about how to um, how how to address parents' concerns about some of those uncomfortable topics, and how to um, make parents who even feel maybe uncomfortable with those topics feel empowered to to discuss them. Uh, the first thing I would say to parents in general just parents, is that if you, if you believe the data I gave you earlier about people not knowing much about 
American government or history or, or the constitution. A lot, of, a lot of adults, including college educated adults, don't know, don't know enough to support the judgments they're making, their political judgments they're making, but are trying to impose those judgments on their, they're trying to tell us that we can't teach certain books. They're banning books in schools. We got people making claims that you can't teach this from Mark Twain, you can't do this from that. And, you know, we, the questions are legitimate and maybe we're gonna have to have conversations about those things in different formats. But I would say that um, maybe a little bit more um, questioning as opposed to asserting, uh, a, a little bit more humility as opposed to arrogance, um, and uh, maybe we need some, and I've done this in the past in, when I lived in New Hampshire, um, we used to run seminars for parents on the very things that we were teaching in my problems for democracy class and my American history class, because the kids were coming home excited about stuff, but they couldn't have conversations with their parents because their parents, you know, didn't know where they're coming from. So we, but the parents got upset because they did, they weren't reading, they had not read, or they don't remember reading some of the books the kids were, like Democracy in America or like um, um, the newest history books that are not the old grubby ones. And so we used to run seminars on Saturdays for the community on the very thing as we were trying to teach kids. And that way the community was able to actually see the, meet the teachers and read the text and say, aha, now I understand the context. Now I understand why this lesson that I was upset about followed that lesson and is going to move to that. So I can't look at a lesson by itself. I have to look at what's preceding it. I have to see how it connects to what's going on in the English class. That is, there is a method to the madness in many cases that I don't think educators get credit for. And my, my problem as a teacher has always been that when I get questioned, not by people who are asking what I call, I'd like to know more about or I'm puzzled by, but rather, you, know, you bastard, what are you, you know, you're doing this, this and this. It's hard to have a conversation that way. But I'm happy to ex explain what I'm doing and see if in fact we can have a conversation about. So the way in which people in fact come to educational questions with superintendent, with principals, with teachers, the school board, that alone can open up a conversation that I think we're not seeing right now as often as we need to. So there's a civility to this that I think we need to practice as a modeling of civic education. And then we have, I think we have one more question and then um, this is from Nancy and I'm, I'm gonna see if I can um, sort of get to the, the question in here. Uh, so the comment was about sort of some courses like sex ed versus social studies and math. Um, and I, I think the question might be, you know, what um, maybe how are schools prioritizing different, um, different courses, different curriculums is that, I think that might be the question in there. Um, so I guess that is the question for a board of ed members. You know, different, different how, how are schools deciding what uh, what courses get um, priority? <clears throat> ah, students? Oh, okay, okay. Who decides curriculum? Who who just who decides curriculum questions? I, I think so. Yeah, sure. Okay. First of all, the state the state mandates. We we all operate under state re, state curriculum mandates for almost every subject matter. Okay. And those, the, the state requirements correlate to the state standardized test exam, exams. Okay. Now, within that, the state allows for more than that to be taught and doesn't necessarily tell you how best to teach it right. or how best to test it. So there's a lot of leeway, but the basic curriculum in, in almost all states is, is heavily weighted from a state department. Now, the, board's, the Board of Education's legal responsibility is to make sure that the teachers and the administrators are in fact living up to the state standards. So we, we have a right to ask for, how are we doing against the state standards? Because the state gives us data every year about how we're doing by school district. Um, <laughs> and how are we doing beyond the state standards? Because if we, I would argue that if we were only 
trying to minimally meet the state standards in our school district, we would be negligent because the state is requiring minimum stuff. And I think we should be way beyond what the state's requiring. Um, that's number one. So the board and the school people, the, the teachers have to be in line with each other about what are we doing beyond the state requirements? What's it look like? What are the courses? Who's taking it? How do we know? Give us evidence from the testing you do that our students are going beyond this. And that's a conversation that school boards are supposed to have with their, with their superintendent and administrators. Um, when there's a curricular change, the school board isn't supposed to make the curriculum change or construct it, it's supposed to approve it. So we get curricular change suggested by the superintendent, assistant superintendent for curriculum. We have curriculum workshops. We get educated in it. We ask questions. We wonder why. We ask if there's really a good reason for this versus that. And when it gets done, we finally say, yeah, that's a program that we should be putting in there. Uh, and even if it costs us more money. So for example, in Guilford, we have the Interna International Baccalaureate Program for a few students. And a few years ago, we had to decide on that. It's expensive. <laughs> And, you know, should we do it? Didn't have to do it. A lot of conversation about that. Um, now we're having conversations about, um, we're doing an audit about whether or not we're doing justice across the curriculum, K through 12, on issues of race, social justice, equity, because we're being told by students and parents that in fact, we're doing an injustice to that. And a lot of our alumni, hundreds of whom, when we went through the conversation about changing the high school mascot, wrote to us and said, we love our school, we love it, but we go to college and we find out that we don't know what we're talking about. And we're actually embarrassed by what we didn't learn. And please look at the curriculum and make it better. So we said, okay, we will. So we're in the midst of actually looking at with experts. Uh, and that's our job, but it's, it's not our job to make the curriculum or to make a course. Um, it's our job to see if the jury hears from the people who are testifying and they can, can be convincing. Excellent. All right. Um, I, don't, I don't see any more questions, just um, several people writing in their thanks. Um, so I think that, uh, if anybody does have any other questions um, and we don't have time to answer them today, um, you know, please let, let, let us know what those missed questions were. Um, send, you, send them along, send them along. I'll answer them. Uh, and I, again, um, Dr. Hirsch, thank you so much for, uh, for coming and speaking with us today. I think that um, I certainly feel uh, a little inspired to think about, you know, the role that I have in my community and in education and in supporting um, st students, especially when it comes to uh, the question I wrote down was how citizenship uh, participation helps society. I think that's going to be my new um, focus for the spring <laughs> um, when it comes to our school programming. Uh, so again, thank you very much for, for coming. Thank, to you. thank you. Thank you. And on behalf of the League of Women Voters, Dick, thank you as well.